you to take a Bible. Turn with me to Luke chapter 23. This morning we'll work through the text from verse 1 to 25 for our reading at the beginning to draw our attention to the Word of God. I'm going to read verses 18 to 25. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, there's one under a chair close by. Page 883 is where you will find this text. So Luke 23 invites you to stand for the reading of the Word. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. The third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. Father, help us now. Help us to understand that this is not simply ever a story. It is not simply a historical fact. This is truth embodied in real time. So help us to see the truth of the gospel today, to believe and to celebrate. We pray in Christ's name, amen. We live in a world of political theater. For the last decade, two decades, three decades, I don't know how long, impeachments, indictments, trials, investigations, particularly in the last five years, Everywhere you turn, someone's screaming injustice. But you hear me, friend. What is recorded right here is the greatest act of injustice that has ever been given to a human being. We see in this text that at the hands of wicked leaders... And in a rational mob, Jesus Christ is sentenced to death by crucifixion. Two major themes, injustice and innocence. We see both of these as we work our way through the text. So let's take a look carefully at what happens. First, the wicked religious establishment delivers Jesus over to Pilate who finds him innocent. They've held their early morning trial to keep with their law. Now the whole company of them, verse 1, so all of these leaders together, not just a representative group, they all arose and brought him, that is Jesus, before Pilate. We see here the fulfillment of what Jesus promised in Luke 18, 32, that he is delivered over to the Gentiles. He's taken to Pilate. Pilate is the governor of Judea, the immediate surrounding area around Jerusalem. He is a corrupt, brutal man, history tells us, and mainly he's not known for showing much wisdom. But among the Jewish people, he had learned some hard lessons and had to develop some level of shrewdness. When he first showed up in Jerusalem as the governor, As a show of power and Roman might, he placed Roman shields on every public gathering place. There was the problem. A Roman shield had an icon on it of a person which Jewish faith expressly calls idolatry and the people refused. They rose up against him and he removed all the shields. And here it is, the week of Passover. 
The moment where the streets of Jerusalem swell was between 500,000 and a million people. The last thing Pilate needs is it reported back to Rome that a riot broke out in Jerusalem during Passover. So here comes this company of religious leaders before Pilate and they began to accuse him saying, now there's three accusations. Number one, we found this man misleading our nation. Now the implication here is that Jesus is inciting people with his teaching. The, they are implying to Pilate that, they, that Jesus is trying to create an uprising by what he says and his actions of moving throughout Galilee and now into Jerusalem. Second accusation, forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. Tribute here means to pay taxes. Forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar. Now, they're the ultimate hypocrites because they don't think they ought to be paying taxes to Caesar. But they accuse Jesus of telling them not to pay taxes to Caesar. This is a bold-faced lie. Jesus told them to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Third accusation, saying that he himself is Christ a king or the Messiah king. Pilate has no idea what this would mean, Messiah, in terms of Judaism. The word they want Pilate to hear is the word king. That Jesus is calling himself a king. That Jesus has a kingdom which he has declared more than once that is not of this world. So this is not a total falsehood in what they are saying, but the implication is false. They are bringing about innuendos to suggest that Jesus is a threat to Roman dominance. So Pilate takes up an interrogation. He asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Now this is what's important about it. Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, you have said so. Now, Pilate's trying to determine if he's actually a revolutionary. If you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, you see more of this interaction that takes place between Jesus and Pilate, picking up in verse 33 of John 18. Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Did you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? your own nation, and the chief priests have delivered you over to me, what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over the Jews, but my kingdom is not of the, from this world. In other words, you're accusing, they're accusing me of, of being a threat to Rome. I'm not a threat. Nobody's fighting. So Pilate brings it back. He asked him again, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come in the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate asked a famous question. What is truth? And he said this, as he, after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him. Now this is where we pick back up in Luke's gospel, verse 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the scribe, the crowd, excuse me, I find no guilt in this man. Now, now, this is the first of three times that Pilate says, this man is innocent. I, I find no guilt in him. But look at how they respond. They were urgent, provoked. He stirs up the people. This is very interesting. Normally, in Luke's gospel, when he has the people, he will say all the people. This is one instance where he doesn't do that. He just says the people. So he's stirring up some people. He's not stirring up everybody. He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this place. So in other words, Pilate, this man is a political threat and you are the governor. And if you're going to be a good governor, then you cannot set him free. Mark gives you further insight of what's going on in this moment. It says, he, Pilate, Mark 15, 10, perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest delivered him up. 
The wickedness of their own hearts is what's bringing this about. But Pilate's got to deal with this because these men are influential. They've already stirred up a crowd. And he needs to de-escalate this situation and he hears an opportunity from Galilee. So we move into the second scene, if you will, of the trial with the Gentiles. And Pilate involves Herod who flippantly mocks Jesus and returns him. When, Herod, when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. <clears throat> I think too quickly, after really reflecting and studying on this, to say Pilate's just passing the buck. I think that's too strong of a statement. I think Pilate here is making a political move. He knows he's got a powder keg on his hands. And Herod understands the Jewish people because Herod is part Jewish. So he is involving Herod so that it doesn't look like what he does here is he just coming down with an iron fist, which you couldn't do with the Jewish people. Now, Herod, this is important, Herod was the governor of Galilee. So think North Carolina, South Carolina, all right? Governor of North Carolina, governor of South Carolina, appointed by Rome. So I, I think sometimes when we read through this text, we think that Herod was a subordinate to Pilate. He wasn't. He was an equal. So he sends him over to Herod. Now, Herod is a sensual, worldly man who murdered John the Baptist because John the Baptist called him out on committing adultery with his brother's wife. Now you think, well, that sets us up. He's just going to kill Jesus right off the bat. That's not what happens. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So it, I just see Herod calling everybody up. Hey, look, the miracle worker's coming. We're going to get a sideshow tonight. We're going to get to see him do some things. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to make him show us what he can do. Jesus gets there, nothing. He questioned him at some length. He made no answer. Jesus' silence creates a dramatic tension here that, that Herod has no power. He has no power over someone who remains Silent. This is a quote. The result is that Herod does not, does not see a sign, but he also does not hear a sound. The visual and acoustic vacuum created mirrors the spiritual blindness and deafness of Herod. Jesus is not wasting his time to say anything to him. Herod is the only person that we read of whom Jesus refuses to say a word. How far gone this man must have been that Jesus doesn't even exchange one word with him. But the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. They can't stand what's happening. Here's Pilate's mocking, he's getting nowhere. Jesus is saying nothing. So they vehemently, with extreme intensity is what it means. They're accusing Jesus, hurling one thing after another. What they want from Herod is a guilty verdict. They want his execution. Here's what Herod does. He makes a mockery out of it. He and with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him and arrayed him in splendid clothing. Remember the accusation he is a king. So they put him in royal clothing and they sent him back to Pilate. And here's where we see the wicked, sadistic nature of both these men. This makes them friends. They get a kick out of the fact that Herod mocks him and sends him back. And by the way, Pilate's going to pick up on this mockery and take it a step further. The mockery made it plain. Nobody takes the charge serious among the two of them. It's just a joke. And as I was thinking on this text, my mind went to Psalm 2. I'm just going to quote it for you. Why do the nations rage and plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. 
you hear me today. God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked. And we move from flippant sarcasm to an irrational mob. And the irrational mob pressures Pilate to sentence Jesus to death by crucifixion. Pilate called them together, the chief priests and the rulers of the people. And he said to them, you brought me this man as one who is misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Second time now. This man's innocent. I don't find him guilty. And Herod didn't find him guilty. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now, you're using the ESV. There's a footnote there that says verse 17 is not in the oldest discovered manuscripts. And verse 17 would read and reads, now he was obliged to release one man to them at the festival. That doesn't change the meaning of the text at all. Gives you some insight into what was happening. Now, this, this, this bargaining chip of beating him was supposed to satisfy the crowd. Now, here's what's interesting. Luke's trying to make us see something very specific, and we're going to get to that very clearly. But John shows you what happens right here. Jesus gets his first beating right here. Pilate sends him back inside. John 19 says, Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in purple robe. They thought what Herod did was so funny, they'll just take it a step further. They came to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. So now they beat him pretty bad. And Pilate went out again and said, See, I'm bringing you out, him out to you, that you may know that I found no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said, Behold the man. Now you would think, that some form of compassion would have fall, fallen on the crowd at this point. They've been repeatedly told this man is innocent. There he stands, beaten, mocked. And here's what they do, verse 18. They all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said, listen, listen, listen to, the, to Pilate, why? What evil has he done? I have found no guilt in him deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent. That means they're incited all the more. Demanding with loud cries repeated over and over again that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. Now, brothers and sisters, what this moment ought to teach you. Now, I, I'm not going to divert off the sermon. I'm just going to make a brief comment into where you live. Those of you standing back shocked at what's going on in the world, or you see things happen, say, I can't believe that happened, or that would never happen. Here's what never should have happened. They should have never killed the Son of God. Don't you think for a moment that the world you live in couldn't go that's irrational. And you ought to look around at what's going on and see the irrational nature of what's happening. It's not the politicians who ultimately are in charge. The politician does what the people want. Their voices prevailed. 
So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. Do you notice the redundancy of Luke there? He released the man who'd been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will, to what they wanted. Barabbas is truly guilty of the very crimes that Jesus is charged with committing. Have you thought about this? Inciting the people, Jesus rejected violence and poses no threat to Roman order. The result is that Pilate, in though, sentences to death a man he has declared innocent and releases a man who is a rebel and a murderer for no apparent reason other than to appease an irrational crowd. It's a quote. Moral blindness is a major theme as the people ironically choose to free a dangerous revolutionary instead of Jesus, a terrorist instead of a righteous man, there is no doubt about their preference as the people state their choice three different times in verse 18, 21, and 23. Roman leadership is seen as weak as Pilate acquiesces to the people. The innocent one is condemned. Jesus is now headed for the cross. And you will see next week that Jesus is murdered in Jerusalem in the place of a man who committed murder. So here's my question. Who is responsible for the death of Jesus? Even though Pilate has protested his innocence three times and his judgment was correct, ultimately, brothers and sisters, the plan of God would not be diverted by Jewish injustice or Roman justice. Jesus ultimately is turned over by the gracious will of God to the deadly will of human beings who are responsible for what they do. Acts chapter 2. This Jesus, verse 23, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed at the hands of lawless men. Acts chapter three, verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Now, why does Luke record this trial the way Luke records it? He wants you to see two things. Innocence and injustice. Jesus is innocent. The injustice, the innocent one, takes the place of a murderer. This is not just a story. This is theological. Here's what you should believe. Here's what you ought to see. That Jesus Christ, the innocent one, died in the place of guilty sinners. The irony here is that the word Barabbas means son of the father. Yet the real son of the father, the innocent one, is the one who goes to death. They freed the wrong son. Why? First Peter chapter two, verse 22. And let me just say before I read, maybe you're me. I was a teenage person who thought religion was what you could do for God so that you could go to heaven. And I showed up with no biblical theological background 
And what I'm about to explain to you was explained to me, and it changed everything. And what I discovered that day was there was nothing I could do for God. Nothing. He had done it for me. And here's what he's done. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Moderns don't want to hear this, but here's the truth. My sin's got to be judged. It has to be. And here's what modern people want to do. You sinner, you a sinner, you awful, you bad. Nobody wants to admit, I am. God's going to judge my sin. And let me just say it more clearly. God has judged my sin. What? He's judged your sin. God has judged justly. Verse 24. He himself bore our sins. Jesus satisfied the judgment of God for your sin on the cross. He didn't just take Barabbas' place. He took yours. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That part of the text has been ripped out and applied in a direction it was never intended in this moment. It is intended to mean the healing that has happened to you is that you are now dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Something brand new has happened. For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. J.C. Ryle said, if you are a true Christian, daily lean your soul on the comforting thought that Christ really is your substitute, that he was punished in your place. Freely confess, like Barabbas, you deserve death and judgment and hell. Cling firmly to the glorious truth that a sinless Savior Savior suffered in your place. Believe in him and the guilty person will go free. Free. Let's go back to the Luke for a second. There are three kinds of people in the text in Luke. Three. First, the irrational. They're the most. They're the majority. Just absolutely irrational. There's no irrational things going on in our world at all, are they? All you got to do is poke some people. Ah! You know, Karen has become a normal word now. Karen is another word for irrational. Just people just snap into absolute irrational behavior. So there's the rational. Just can't just get caught up in the wind of what's going on around. Then there's the rational. That's Pilate. Pilate's very rational about this. It's not, he's not on Jesus' side. He's just, this guy's not guilty. What's wrong with y'all? He's not compassionate. I mean, he beats him and mocks him. Dispassionate. Is innocent. Then there's the flippant. You know those people. Everything's a joke. That's Herod. Just a joke. Just the way you get through life. You never have to deal with what's really wrong inside of you or with anybody else in the world. It's all just a joke. Just drink a beer and have fun. I mean, just a joke. Hear me. Do you know who the next person in the Gospel of Luke to believe is? I'll read it for you. One of the criminals who hanged railed at him, saying, Are you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But on the other side, the other rebuked him, saying, 
Do you not fear God? Since you understand the same sentence, you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly are receiving the due reward of our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. The fourth time Luke tells you, he's innocent. This man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All the words of grace that pour from the cross. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care. Jesus died for it. He died for you. Will you repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your substitute for your sin this day and cry out to him to save you? Let's pray. Lord, I pray for men and women in this room to cry out to you to confess their sin and profess their need for a savior. And I pray for every believer in this room to again be reminded of your goodness and your grace toward us and to cry out to you in a heart of gratitude for your grace. And now, Lord, I pray that this won't just be a song. This won't be the end. This won't be the wrap up, the credits. Lord, I pray now that we would say to you, much like that thief on the cross, the Lamb of God. You are the one who takes the sin of the world. Lead us as we worship you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.